this week on the Backtable Podcast. So we talked a little about how UHC owns change. What are some of the insurance carriers that are significantly affected by this whole thing? So in my market, and and I can speak to that, um, it affected uh, all of our blues. It affected uh, UPMC. It affected the Novitas, which is our local Medicare carrier. And when I talked to my billing company, when all of a sudden we started having this really big sucking sound in the corporate checking account, because all of a sudden the cash level went like whoop down like this. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to get through this, what we were doing with this. They told me that the number was north of a third and a little bit less than 40% of our entire collections were impacted. So this is big penetrance, right? And and again, I'm everybody who knows me knows that I'm not somebody who tries to exaggerate or, or whine, but I literally had to loan money back to the corporation for one pay period so we could make payroll while we were figuring it out. I mean, it was crazy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. This episode is supported by Reflow Medical, makers of high-performance medical devices for peripheral and coronary interventions. Reflow's approach to finding solutions to unmet clinical needs is known as the innovation algorithm, where physicians work with Reflow in a continuous loop throughout development. Successes include the wingman catheter for a rapid CTO crossing, the SPECS LP, low profile support catheter for improved vascular access and crossing, and CORA catheters, a suite of tools for use in complex PCI procedures. The innovation algorithm, products that are physician imagined, reflow engineered. For more information, visit reflowmedical.com. And now back to the show. This is Krishna Manava, I'm a vascular surgeon practicing in Columbus, Ohio. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Bob Tahara, who is the current president of OEIS, to talk about a current topic, the cyber attack on change healthcare and how it's affected uh, the entire healthcare system, but particularly practices like Bob's and mine. Bob, uh, would you care to introduce yourself to the audience who uh, may or may not know you? Sure. Thanks, Krishna, and thanks to the whole Backtable team for inviting me on. It's a, a great podcast, and it's something that I think really carries some good information. I'm a little bit of an anomaly. I am a private practice, solo vascular surgeon, and I've spent my entire career in a rural area in northwest Pennsylvania with high smoking rates, high diabetes rates, and really bad access to care. And my practice has traditionally been split between kind of more cutting edge, minimally invasive arterial stuff, and then a lot of complex iliocaval stuff. So, you know, to put in perspective for the audience, I've done almost exclusively pedal access for all of my intra or infrainguinal interventions since 2013, just the way we've done them all. And we've done a ton of iliocaval work, including some of the trials. So I'm, I'm still pretty active on that stuff, despite again, being a solo rural guy. And then I have a hospital satellite practice, which is about two hours away that keeps me busy with inpatient work as well, including full spectrum of open cases still. Um, And that's clinically where I'm at. Um, I'm the current president of OEIS, and I've been the technical director running all the day-to-day operations for the OEIS registry for about five years now. So your hospital is two hours from your practice? Yeah, we, we, so again, we, it, it's a rural area. I have a hospital system, which are two small rural hospitals that I still maintain privileges at, but I haven't done a case there in about seven years now. Kind of one of those acquisition type scenarios where a larger system came in. It was pretty toxic. And so I just said, I'm, I'm at an age where I don't need to be annoyed anymore. Uh, another hospital really, really wanted me to come there and quite frankly made it both uh, easy for me to do and worth my while. Uh, so I spend about 30% of my time over there and I take all my open cases there. Gotcha. We both had pretty busy mornings. I was coaching my kids multiple sports and you were doing kendo. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about kendo for those out there that don't know about it? So k- kendo is an interesting thing. I think you need to understand the backdrop on this though before I tell you kendo. When I was <laughs> a lot younger and I believe it was probably a little bit bourbon enhanced, I made the promise to myself, I think it was about 25, 
that every decade birthday, I was going to learn a new and unrelated skill. So at 30, I did gunsmithing and I learned how to build guns from scratch. At 40, I did watchmaking, which was propelled by, I was getting very annoyed at some of the manufacturers and industry about prototyping some changes that I wanted to have, erectomy devices and, and other end of ascar devices. And then I found out I just like doing watches. Who cares about doing the prototyping? So at 50, I was torn between, do I do big data? I was looking at learning how to do non-relational databases and actually doing programming or doing something else physical. And Kendo won out. So, so Kendo is my age 50 product, um, and it's a full contact Japanese fencing uh, where we use essentially a bamboo sword striking. We do this in full armor, and it's full speed, full contact. Um, so it, it keeps me kind of fresh. So I'm a second degree now and what they call Nidon, and hopefully I'm going to test out for my third degree here this fall. That's so cool. I've seen some of the images from Kendo, and it's, it, it's remarkable. I mean, it just looks badass. It's fun, but I'll tell you, and again, you got two surgeons on here, so we were talking before, this is kind <laughs> of a, a nice departure, if you will, because we love our IR and IC colleagues, but it's rare to have two surgeons on this podcast just uh, kind of having the floor. Um, what, uh, what my Sansai has told me is he's actually had multiple previous surgeons of different disciplines. I'm the only vascular surgeon. And every one of them to a, a person has told him that their staff and the operating room staff are much happier when they've been going to kendo and doing sparring because you eliminate all your aggression and it, it just <laughs> really, really calms you down. Now, for those of you out there who know me, they're all laughing because they're like, how does Bob's aggression go away? But it, it's true. It's definitely a moderating force. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Well, let's dive into the topic today. As we all know, or most of us know, back in February, February 21st, Change Healthcare, which is a clearing large clearing house fell victim to a cyber attack by a ransomware family known as black cat apparently six terabytes of data were stolen and then fast forwarding a couple weeks later march 4th a 22 million dollar bitcoin ransom payment was made to black cat so that's uh is sort of the genesis of this episode. Obviously, there's so much fallout from this, but what's your knowledge uh, and your your thoughts about change healthcare and how it plays into you and your practice? Well, I, I think the first thing, Krishna, is both you and I are in the wrong business. We ought to just become hackers, and maybe I screwed up at age 50, and I should have done the computer thing instead because, you know, <laughs> $22 million for ransomware makes my eyes cross. The change is a big player. And, you know, I have a lot of personal experience with this. Uh, the electronic medical record that I use is a product called Text Talk uh, MD, which was actually interestingly founded by literally a Houston and a NASA rocket scientist who used it to track his NASA projects. And a friend of his was a cardiologist and said this would be a good EMR. And I've had that product since 2003, actually, and have helped develop some parts of it and templates. But as the whole MIPS macro quality program stuff started to evolve even before the 2015 MIPS MACRA Act, MDON, which was the predecessor to change, was this, the service provider that started to get used and has been programmed in with my EMR. So change affects me, not just on the financial side like many people have, but it also affects the connection that our EMR has with the cloud some of the data that goes back and forth for things that are, are mandated, either for MIPS or for just other data collection that the government wants or Medicare is monitoring. It also runs our electronic prescription. So all of our electronic prescribing is through that. And then finally, it's the EDI and Clearinghouse, that the electronic data exchange or interchange and Clearinghouse for a lot of the uh, payers, including our, our local Medicare carrier. Uh, so that it's a, it's a big deal. And change and previous to it, MDON has kind of grown by amalgamation. Um, they've been acquiring and absorbing things. And so it's it's this large cobbled together thing. And then United Healthcare went and gobbled up the whole thing in 2021. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later about some of the objections to that merger um, that have kind of proven true. But that's how change directly affects us, Krishna, or our, our interface with it. So a lot of this is new to me. I mean, I buried my head in the sand for a lot of the the processes between how our practices actually get paid and how we send bills out. So 
for the listeners out there who maybe are early in their practice or thinking of starting a private practice, can you explain just at a high level a clearinghouse and how that inter- interacts with most of our practices? I know some of the other big clearinghouses besides Change are Waystar and Trizetto, and I think there's dozens of others, smaller ones as well. But what is the role of these clearinghouses? So what Krishna just alluded to, I think is really important for everybody listening here. We spend years and years and years training and getting experience to take care of patients and doing things from simple to complex procedures. And most of us are abject morons about how we get paid. And it's a really problematic thing because it leaves us at the mercy of a lot of other people. Um, I've been in private practice now for 14 years. And prior to that, I was employed by a hospital system. And I can tell you that the learning curve was pretty steep for me. But I'd also give you guys, as I'm talking through this, give you some recommendations. First and foremost, hire a really good billing company. Don't try and do this stuff internally. It is way too complicated. So these these clearinghouses, I don't really have to deal with directly. My billing company does that. And, And this is true for almost everybody. So there's software packages that they use to to send your claims, whether to commercial payers or to Medicare or however that gets done, often do not directly communicate with the payers themselves. And instead, they go through these clearinghouses, which are, again, big services that are designed to try and expedite, facilitate, or consolidate how bills are rendered to these payers, along with the information that goes to them. And, and it's quite interesting when you start looking at it from a business thing, because as, as again, more and more consolidation is occurring, there seems to be bigger and bigger players in this. Now, change is one of the biggest, obviously, as the implications it's had for the entire healthcare market here in the U.S. But these groups or these organizations are becoming bigger and more pervasive and to some extent more powerful. So it leads us in a kind of a quandary because we, there's a buffer now. This clearinghouse has essentially been inserted between you or it and your billing entity and those payers, and they act as an electronic clearinghouse or an electronic data interchange medium. So we send data for the claims and supporting data to them. They send it on to the payers. And theoretically, that is supposed to somehow make things smoother and better. Now, if you look at it at high level again, it, it makes sense because instead of your billing company or your practice, if you're still going to try and do it internally, which again, I don't recommend. But if you're going to do that, what ends up happening is you'd have to deal with each and every one of those companies individually. And in fact, for part of the time change was down, we had to do that. We had to do that with our local Blue Cross provider, Highmark. And then we were trying to deal with uh, two or three other payers that were big guns for us in my market. Uh, And it was cumbersome to do so. So the clearinghouses definitely do have a function. I don't want to say that they don't. But that's at a high level how it works. They're a buffer between the payers and your billing company, and they do electronic data interchange. goes two-directionally. So did these clearinghouses really come of age back when we really switched to electronic records? I think, and and again, I'm not an expert on that particular history, but my sense of this is it's certainly been expedited. But but again, we, we all, there's nobody, I think, let me rephrase that. There's a scant minority of people probably in the United States left that are not using an electronic medical record, it, either their primary office practice, or if they have a hospital component, certainly at their hospital practice. Um, and I think everybody would agree that on the physician side, EMRs usually are simply pain in the ass, right? Despite all of the benefits that they bring for data collection and consolidation and getting stuff in one place, there's complexity, which frustrates physicians because it, it's not the way we were trained to work. And I guess now, as training and things evolve, it will be the way physicians are trained to work. But if you think about it, I think the bulk of people still didn't have a workflow or how they thought about patients that conformed how AMRs work. So it's a source of frustration for physicians. So I think part of the takeoff to your to your point, Krishna, has been as, as physicians have become frustrated with how they deal with these systems, having buffers like clearinghouses probably have made sense. And that's probably one of the reasons that they've made inroads. So we talked a little about how UHC owns change. What are some of the insurance carriers that are significantly affected by this whole thing? So in my market, and and I can speak to that, um, it affected uh, Oliver Blues. It affected uh, UPMC. It affected 
the Novitas, which is our local Medicare carrier. And when I talked to my billing company, when all of a sudden we started having this really big sucking sound in the corporate checking account, because all of a sudden the cash level went like whoop down like this. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to get through this, what we were doing with this. They told me that the number was north of a third and a little bit less than 40% of our entire collections were impacted. So this is big penetrance, right? And and again, I'm everybody who knows me knows that I'm not somebody who tries to exaggerate or, or whine, but I literally had to loan money back to the corporation for one pay period so we could make payroll while we were figuring it out. I mean, it was crazy. Wow. So when this happened in February, February 21st, when did that start affecting when did you start noticing it affecting your practice i so i've got a great billing company which and i'm not going to put a plug in from here so it's commercial but if anybody wants to know i'm happy to tell them offline um but those guys almost invariably for my commercial payers from the time i send the claim which is usually a copy of my progress or op note with coding embedded in it um they usually process that claim within 48 business hours and i'm usually getting paid about two weeks so the lag for me was two to three weeks. We started to see money drop off and it was that first pay period in March where all of a sudden we didn't have enough cash literally in the bank to cover payroll, which never happens because I'm extremely conservative fiscally in how we run this practice. And, and I was like, it, it looks like we got no money for the last three weeks. And in, in fact, the claims tailed off right there because of that. Now, the parenthetically, I guess that's the double-edged sword of having a really efficient billing company. Right, I, I bet most folks' companies aren't that efficient. They probably actually have a lag or almost like a buffer, and so they may or may not have seen it quite as quickly. Wow. So can you dive into that just a little deeper? So what were some of the maneuvers that your billing company in court instituted to, to deal with this? Well, they do everything in turn. I mean, you know, I, again, this was a little bit transparent or a little bit opaque to me because they, they let us know something was going on. Okay, and I didn't think a whole lot of it until I started seeing money drop down in the bank account. And then we had another conversation about it, and they had already initiated every pathway that they could. So as as this was unfolding into weeks two, especially in three of the whole episode, if you will, the individual payers were starting to scramble and try and figure out ways that they could actually keep things moving. And so my billing company started talking directly to the different payers again and Medicare. The other thing that they did although I didn't take them up on it, is they almost immediately uh, got us the information, links on how to do an advance payment for Medicare, um, which you can do. I have done that once previously around the pandemic to try and you know help buffer cash flow with that. And I just found it, quite frankly, to be onerous. And it couldn't mentally get my head wrapped around when they were debiting the payments on the back end, not because they were doing anything wrong. It just wasn't the way I was thinking about it. So- I chose not to do that this time, uh, and I just relied on on in internal resources. Yeah, with the pandemic, I think it was you know the PPP money, and I think much of that was forgiven. It doesn't sound like that's going to be sort of the same with this. This is no sort the, of Medi an, the, the Medicare Advance payment you have to pay back. Now it's a good program if you if you are heavily into straight Part B Medicare, and you have fairly high volume or fairly high level of gross reimbursement and there is a disruption because of one of these technical problems. I, I don't think that the listeners should necessarily write it off. I just chose to because, you know, while Medicare, like most vascular surgery practices in the United States, makes up a pretty good chunk, it's certainly not exclusive. And again, I, I just the way that they do it is not the way I would have done it. They do it and basically debit it out of your claims a certain percentage by some, again, formula that I really don't understand, although I've read it. And um, it's difficult for you to, to tally it. And when we did this last time, we had to have the billing company do a completely separate set of spreadsheets just so I could follow it. And, and again, the only thing I would say, there are lots of people trying to help us, but we could do a raise of the hands here. You know, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. I mean, how many people really want to depend on the goodwill of Medicare to get their calculations right? I would not be one of those. So obviously this affects our practice. To my understanding, this change healthcare thing has affected every level or every side of service, ranging from hospitals down to pharmacies and patients getting their medications. What sort of your, what have you heard on the streets, for, you know, as far as some of this goes? 
Well, it, some folks I've talked to have had the same problem we did. Again, our our prescription, our electronic prescribing, or ERX, whatever the terminology you, your hospital, your clinic, your office uses, um, we had to do all paper scripts for this entire time until they went back online. Now, again, as a vascular surgeon, it's not like I read a ton of new prescriptions, um, but anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, things like that, that, that was a big deal for, for the relatively few people we still have to give narcotic pain medicine to, you know, open cases, you know, primarily. That was a big deal. So, and I've heard kind of similar feedback from that from some of my other colleagues at the same hospital that I work out of. Um, even though they didn't necessarily have the same interface with their EMR, there were problems with the pharmacies, uh, CBS, and I forget who else, uh, had some difficulty to my, to my recollection. And, and don't quote me on that. I might be wrong on which company it was. But, but there were a couple of big national chains, and there were some processing problems with getting those things across. I, I don't know what level that was at, but it's definitely affected things for patients just getting their meds. Yeah. In my naivety, I didn't realize that you know, a significant number of hospitals are, are deeply affected by this. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that hospitals also deal with change healthcare and other clearinghouses just like we do in private practice. Yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's pervasive. I mean, it goes back to that question, you know, that again, I think it's bantied about and, you know, people have gotten to be a big cliched after the 2008 financial crisis, right? You know, too big to fail. And it starts to beg the question about consolidation for some of these core services and not just from a power dynamic perspective, how much market power these companies have, but if they have a technical problem like this, it didn't even have to be ransomware. And then the only other thing I would I would really reflect on about that, how it pervasive it is, and again, for all the listeners here, every physician here, you think about the Mickey Mouse hoops that we have to jump through for every con, siren thing for the surgeons. 14 layers of paper, make sure you mark the thing, hold the clipboard for the patient, blah, de, blah, blah, de, blah. And, and yet these people couldn't lock their system down enough that they didn't compromise six terabytes worth of patient data or data. Now let's think about that for a minute, a terabyte. That's a number that I don't think most people really even understand what the hell that is, but that's a big chunk of data. And so they paid 22 million in Bitcoin. And the last I heard they were getting re-ransomed and they were getting kind of threatened with having more patient data exposed because apparently there was not honor among thieves and one group of crooks cheated another group of crooks. And now we're going to show you and get to go back to the bank, if you will, to get more money. But I think, you know, again, grousing aside, the more we centralize these things, it makes each problem with that central service then that much more impactful. And I think there's an age old, both political and systems and practical debate about, you know, dispersing stuff and having decentralized systems versus centralized systems across the host of things. But, you know, clearly in healthcare, this didn't work in our advantage. I had no idea how valuable medical records were. And when I looked it up on the dark web, credit card data is worth $3 for individual credit card data. $15 for a social security number. And then can you believe $60 for a medical record? I didn't know these are, there were going rates on, on this sort of uh, data. Again, the, the frank irony of that, Krishna, and I'm old enough to remember this, when people used to sell their practices, they would value the charts, right? Because what did they represent? They represented patients and, or patient lives if you're an insurer, right? But the charts had value, and of course, that all went away for for valuations on medical practice. But when you think about it, gee whiz, there appears to still be a valuation to that information uh, on the dark side, right? So that, uh, that that's kind of that's kind of interesting. And then look at the other dark side of this. And you and I had talked about this before the episode. You know, I mean, there's been some pretty ugly press about what this value is as as everybody gets squeezed, and now you had practices that couldn't make payroll or were going under. Um, the Corvallis Clinic is probably the most publicized example of this. And then the owner of the company, so United Healthcare, of the company that got ransomware change, goes and can strong arm and buy practices at a discount. I mean, that, that reporting really should make everybody sit back and question a little bit. Okay, again, is it really in our best interest as a medical system to have these organizations so broadly entranced with all this vertical integration that this can occur. 
I, I again, I, I never really, I mean, I never thought it was a great thing, but this has really made me step back and think or we probably need to be a little bit more diligent as a nation in some of this antitrust and some of this mergers and acquisitions examination. Because, you know, again, when this had, when 2021, when United went to take over change or buyout change or whatever that transaction ultimately was, the, the DOJ actually filed a suit to prevent it and they lost. Right. There was some real concern. The American Hospital Association, I believe, and I don't remember whether the AMA did or not, were all opposed to this. And one of the things that got brought up was cybersecurity and this, oh, no, don't worry about it. Well, OK, I, I think I think it's no longer theoretical. Well, I think the vulnerability of the entire health sector here in the U.S. is 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 a really big concern with all this. But it's 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 misplaced sometimes, Krishna. Right. It's like, again, yeah. it, and I think we can all identify with this. At my one hospital, the IT people had a fit because I use a MacBook. This is what I'm on now. And I virtualize all of my Windows operating systems and I run all my IT and I, I know how to do that a little bit. And they didn't want to let me use a private device. And they didn't want to let me use a private device because there was a potential security thing. Well, this hospital also got ransomware because they left a, like a simple password on a router, one of the default like admin admin type things is what I heard through the grapevine. And so for all the fluff about change your EMR password for every 14 days and it can't repeat, you need seven, you know, special characters and, and a swear word in it. But yet the basic systems are so vulnerable that somebody with the know-how can get around it. And I think, you know, it, it, people really start to need to rethink how much do we emphasize some of this Mickey Mouse stuff and, and, and how much should we really be paying attention to the bigger ticket items? I, I call it missing the forest, not for the trees but for the gum wrapper in the ditch on the side of the road <laughs> while the forest burns. <laughs> you know, um, I don't want to dive too much into this cybersecurity stuff because if you go back, uh, there was an excellent, excellent episode of Backtable number 349 where Aaron had Jason Newton on talking all about cybersecurity for physicians excellent episode. I highly encourage anyone who hasn't listened to it to listen to it. I re-listened to it again because the first time it kind of glazed over me, but in the current climate, it really hit hard. But uh, cybersecurity should be at front of mind for, for a lot of us in, in these private practices. I would definitely agree. You know, we, you can get, and, and again, going back to protecting yourself, uh, I think a lot of physicians have billing and omission insurance which really covers if you have a claims problem or you know there's an issue with your records or somebody misbilled so you don't get dinged for it and, and you can cover that in the event of a penalty. Some of those policies have a coverage for different types of cybersecurity, data leaks, HIPAA information stuff, but not all of them do. And so, you know, when you're looking at it's like everything else, right? We again, physicians are notoriously bad at this. Somebody hands you a document this thick, it's got like 500 pages of very small print, and as we all get older, we can't see it anyways, and then there's 17 yellow stickies on there, sign here, right? And we're in the middle of a busy day with some patient screaming at us, and the OR angio going, you're late, and everything else, and we sign this stuff and we move on. I really recommend to people take the time to read these things before you affix your signature to it, and, and I think you really ought to look, if you, if you don't have B&O insurance, you probably should, quite frankly. Because we're all subject to being audited either by a payer or by CMS at some point in time. And it will happen, particularly if you're a busy clinician. So you might want to just get ahead of that curve, but read those contracts. And if you can get one that covers some of this data breach stuff, either if it happens to your payers or it happens to you, that would probably be a really good thing. You know, this topic is painful for all of us out there because it's something we never really want to think about. And many of us think, oh, this isn't going to happen to me. I'm, you know, a small time practice in wherever America, but, you know, it affects small practices just as much, if not more than large, large organizations. So it is extremely important. And uh, I, I, I also would encourage everyone to make sure that they have this addressed in their policies. Besides that, what are some of the other sort of lessons, action items that we can take to deal with this and protect ourselves going forward? Well, diversification, right? But, uh, but again, I think that's much more of a strategy in talking to your billing company and seeing 
what clearing house or clearing houses do they use? And I would ask, I've already asked, I, I haven't gotten a great answer yet, to be honest with you. Is there a way for us to be redundant in which of these clearing houses we use? So if one gets hit, maybe we can simply shift over. Um, and they're looking at that. that. That was something that I'd asked them. That wasn't something that they had really considered. The second thing that I think that is important about being redundant or in terms of being prepared, then again, I'll go back to what I said before. I'm, I'm a very, very conservative business owner. Um, every month we transfer a set amount of money to cover the following year's malpractice, our 401k liabilities and contingencies. So I always at the end of every fiscal year already have the money in the bank for when the true ups and stuff come around the other year. Um, that gives us a little bit bigger cushion if we really need to draw on it in a situation like this. And I am always reticent to do so because that is in my mind monies that have already been committed. But I think a lot of practices fly much closer to the margin. Um, and I think that's a natural consequence of decreasing reimbursements and increasing costs. So I don't think it's a sin, but I do think everybody should step back and look at this if you're in private practice and, and, and make some decisions on that. You know, you know the, it, there's also structural things you can do. Um, I salary myself very low. My base salary is the 25th percentile. So I, I basically get my entire comp on bonus at the end of every year. But, but what does that do? That smooths out the revenue cycle. So if there's a disruption like this, by and large, my staff and my operations are not at risk. Right now, I, I've got the luxury of living in a low cost area. I can do that there. I can hear some groans right now from people on the coast, uh, you know, New York, Boston, LA, I'd say move. But, it, you know, assume, aside from that, I mean, there, there's a reality there that those areas are more difficult to do that in just because of the scale of things. But I would definitely recommend that that's an action item that you probably should look at if you were impacted by one of these things, this thing. And if you haven't been impacted by this thing, sooner or later, you're going to be impacted by one of them, Right. Beyond that, I'm not sure there's much we can really do as individual physicians, Krishna. I mean, we're going to turn on some heat, I think, uh, on a societal level and organized medicine level about what's gone on. Um, where that goes, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, as most people know, the legislative process and regulatory process can be pretty complicated. And, and sometimes physicians have not stepped up and really sat at that table well enough. So again, will, the plug I'll put in here is on advocacy is make sure you contribute to your societal PACs. You know, OEIS has a new PAC that, that we're going to go be live with at the annual meeting because that, that political action money isn't, it's not fluff. It, without, without being able to have that kind of seat at the table and access, you really can't make changes from a physician perspective like this. So I, I, I think maybe the final action item I would say, Krishna, is I, I think, again, Physicians are notorious for not wanting to be involved on the political side of things. Um, and they're very notorious for not wanting to be financially involved with it. You go to a trial lawyer's meeting, you know, Jerry Nitzwicky says this all the time. They pass the head at the door. Nobody gets in or out without contributing. And, and they've got a very robust PAC funding because of that that allows them to work on the regulatory thing. And, you know, the question I'd pose for anybody who's really aversive to this is who's better positioned to try and help our patients and our employees and keep our practices solvent running than us. Nobody else cares, right? So I think we have to take an interest in that. So that that those are the things I can see that would be action items. But I mean, short of me going and joining the hacker organization and getting a slice of that 22 mil, I'm not sure we can direct it to more ethical, you know, ethical hackers to only target the mean companies, right? It's just not going to happen. You know, I was talking to Terry Yates, who is the president of my company that does my revenue cycle management. And she said, look, you know, there's some simple things, you know, like we talked about, making sure your EHR vendor has a cybersecurity plan, make sure you have a backup plan for paper charting or whatnot uh, to continue to function if you have to, to get off the grid. I learned that within our practices, our PAC system can be hacked too. So if you have a separate PAC system, then your EMR, I mean, there's, those are all different ways that, that things can get infiltrated. Let me springboard on that because one of the things that did keep us running day to day, I didn't have to have paper backups because our EMR packages and data are all resident on premises. They're in our server room. And some of these EMRs you can self host. And I would, again, it's an expense and it's a pain in the butt and you have to do this, but this did play out here. If I was completely cloud-based during this and dependent on them, 
um, then we would have had to have paper backups or we would have had to have some other stuff. And, and that can, I think, be very disruptive. I, I really don't understand how anybody will be able to do pay for it today's day and age after becoming dependent on these clunky EMRs for the most part, right? So, so that might be another thing to look at, which a lot of people aren't willing to bite off, but that is a way to not be so dependent on a centralized system again. Okay, excellent. You know, we're uh, coming up next week. Uh, we're recording this a week before OEIS. I'm sure uh, there'll be some discussion, if not a lot of discussion about this at the meeting amongst a lot of us. Is this, uh, is, do you think there'll be any formal formal discussions on this or talks? My suspicion here, I'm pulling up the schedule right now, but on Friday, we have an advocacy session that I'm moderating with Jerry Nitzwicky, and it's when I'm going to do my presidential update. We're going to do the updates from the Hill and the advocacy from Jason McKittrick, who's our lobbyist and our advisor there. But there is also a legal session that is being run on Thursday afternoon. That goes 1230 to 230 with uh, Paul Rudolph, Murad Hussein, and Jason Grease. And my guess is that is going to come up in the Q&A. Um, they usually field quite a few questions like that. Uh, and my guess is this is going to come up in the advocacy sections again about what is it that we as physicians or as an organization in terms of OEIS or the, the other parent specialty societies like SVS and CERN and Sky, you know, what can we do to try and impact that? Um, and I think there will probably be a pretty fair amount of conversation about it. So if you're going to the meeting, great. It's going to be a great meeting. It always is. Um, if you're not, uh, we'll miss you. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. I can't wait to have a beer with you, but we can commiserate about this a little bit more. Do you have any any additional thoughts, remarks uh, about this whole thing? No, I, I mean, I think I've covered it. I've been thinking about this a lot uh, because of how the impact it did have on me locally. But I, but I think it's another call to action for physicians. I think we have been sitting back feeling like we are hostages to the situation. So, you know, part of the presidential address I'm going to, I'm going to give draws on a lot of analogies or, or lessons that came out of some of the time I did in the military and some of the things that other people did. And one of the big things is this concept when you get ambushed that you got to get off the X, right? And to get off the X, you really have to realistically assess why you're there, what's happening, and without throwing a bunch of blame around, figure out how to move out of that zone so you're not just taking fire. And I think that's where we're at as physicians right now. I think we're taking fire from multiple directions, whether it's financial, regulatory, reimbursement, bad press. Uh, there are a lot of things that are that are getting thrown at us all at once, and, and that makes it really tough. And I, and I think physicians have to start becoming more involved in, in controlling our own destiny moving beyond these ambushes and really trying to improve what we're doing. And I think that's going to really require people to get a lot more involved in advocacy and governmental relations and, and their parent societies than they have been up until now. And I think it doesn't matter what specialty you're in. If you look at the organization, whether it's SVS or SUR or SKY or kind of as an umbrella OEIS, because it, it's, it's the intersection between those things in some ways, but we always need more people to do work. We always need more people to get involved. And everybody's busy, and so everybody kind of sits back and says somebody's going to take care of it. But it, at some point, if we don't, more of these things are going to happen, and it might not be a two-month thing this time, right? So, I, so I, I really think the final thought I would say is to anybody listening, I, I know it sounds onerous. Good God, how can I add one more thing into my already busy day? But if we don't get enough people to do that, our days are may not be so busy because we may not have anything to do. You know, that's a great point. And to be out there alone and scared and feel helpless uh, is is a really, really bad feeling, especially dealing with something as big as this. So banding together and joining something bigger than you as an individual is there is some comfort and reassurance in that. So so excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. I know this is a really busy time of year for you uh, with all you have going on. Uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us on this episode and uh, really look forward to, to seeing you here soon. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. 
Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Lambir Singh Sundu. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 